Hey, it's Jim, and this is level one of the CFA program, the topic on quantitative methods and the learning module on rates and return. This learning module is coupled with one called time value of money, and you really can't have one without the other. Make sure you have your financial calculator handy. We'll be doing lots and lots of calculations. Go ahead and take a look at these LOSs. Notice there's a calculate and a calculate and a calculate. But then we're going to start with the concept of rates of return, discount rates, opportunity cost, and how the risk-free rate of interest plays a role in not only, here, let me go back here real quick, not only in determining rates and returns, but also being applied in our time value of money calculations, which we'll do in the next learning module. And then we'll go ahead and compare uh, a money-weighted and a time-weighted return. Those are essentially just geometric returns. One considers dollar amounts and one ignores it. That third LOS uh, sounds to me like a super highly likely question to show up on the exam. So let's go ahead and start with what's interestingly enough, a simple little time value of money concept. Uh, suppose I gave you a choice. Suppose I said, hey, I'll let you have $1,000 today, or you can come back sometime in the future and get that same $1,000. In this example, it's five years, but it could be two years or 10 years or even one day. Now, of course, you'd rather have that $1,000 today, even in the absence of inflation, because you can invest that capital today and it will earn interest until tomorrow or two years from now or five or 10 years uh, from today. So this concept of time value of money uh, links consumption today and consumption at some time in the future. Remember, if we had a thousand today, we could go out and spend it. But if we have a thousand today, we could also invest it in a bank and earn interest or invest it in some other kind of a financial security. And as long as the interest rate is positive, we would have more than $1,000 tomorrow or two years or five years from today, which means, which means that we can consume more tomorrow or two years or 10 years from today. Now that's really, uh, interesting trade-off, and we're going to talk about this throughout level one, level two, and level three, is what's the better decision? Consume today or consume tomorrow? And as good financial analysts, it's our job to help our clients make that determination. Now, we can't force them. We can't say, you know what, I want you to go out and spend $50,000 today and build a swimming pool in your backyard. We can say, hey, here are the advantages of, of consuming today, but maybe we could invest it. And five years from today, you could build a $100,000 pool. All right, here, this directly addresses the LOS. Interest rates can be thought of in three ways. So we have that $1,000 today. We're going to go ahead and invest it. Well, this concept of a required rate of return is the minimum rate of return that we must generate in order to go ahead and forego current consumption today in order to make that investment. So that's the required rate of return. Now, what we also can consider it as is a form of a discount rate. What we always do is we say something like, hey, let's suppose that we're going to expect to receive some cash flow in the future. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's an increase in salary. Maybe it's uh, exercise of stock options. Maybe it's an inheritance. So we're going to have some money that we expect to get at some time in the future. Let's say it's a year or two from today. And let's say it's $1,000 just to be consistent with the numbers that we had in that previous slide. Well, what we can do is we can take an interest rate and we can use that to compute the present value or the equivalent today's value of that cash or that capital to be received at some time in the future. You know, for example, if we if we expect to get $1,000 a year from now, its current value might be only $900. Now it might be $950, it might be $980, and that depends on current market rates of interest, which will be reflective of the riskiness of those individual types of securities. So think of it out as a discount rate. Now remember, we have a future value of 1,000. We discount it back to the present 
at a discount rate, which means that we make it less. So discounting means that we're going to turn a higher future value into a lower present value to reflect, to reflect the idea of earning interest over that time period. And then, of course, we can't have a conversation here without diving into the world of economics. This opportunity cost is the best foregone alternative. I have this conversation with my students and my children all the time when they say things like, to me like, uh, hey, dad, or hey, Jim, how about if instead of having class today, we take some money and we go buy some Fortnite skins? Do you guys play Fortnite? I don't, but apparently lots and lots of younger people do. And I always say to my students and my children, I'm like, all right, so you spend $5 on Fortnite skins today, then what? You know, so you're cooler, I guess, when you're playing this game. But what could you have done? You could have taken that $5. And if this were, you know, let's say 20 some years ago, you could have bought one share of Apple stock. And today that would be worth, well, who knows how much that would be worth, but you get the sense. So think about this silly example that I'm giving you. How much joy do you get out of having a new Fortnite skin today and maybe tomorrow and next week versus taking that $5 and having, oh, tens of thousands of dollars in 15 or 20 years. So think of opportunity cost, that best foregone alternative. Now, here's the really, really cool thing about the CFA program. Uh, the Institute is gonna try to educate us on how to measure that valuable alternate, alternative investment when we decide to consume today. And it's a super challenge. And I'm guessing that you guys know this from just your regular old lifetime experiences. All right, look at this gray box here. Here's a great model. We used to call this um, uh, the building blocks model. Uh, it's gone by a couple of different names over the years. But what we're saying now is let's go ahead and ask ourselves the question, what is an interest rate and what are its components? You know, for example, if you went to the bank today and said, hey, I'd like to refinance my mortgage. And the banker says to you, OK, the refinance rate is, let me just pick a number, 7%. And you scratch your head and you think to yourself, hey, where did the mortgage banker get that rate of interest? Well, this gray box tells us we start out with the real, the real risk-free rate of interest. So let's go ahead and talk about the risk-free component here first. That risk-free component is the default risk-free rate that's earned on a default risk-free security. Now, there's probably only one organization that can issue a truly default risk security these days, and that's the U.S. Treasury Department. So a proxy for the risk-free rate of interest is typically the one-year Treasury bill yield. Maybe that's 2%, maybe it's 3%, maybe that's 4%, but that's a starting point. Now, the real part of the component, that takes out the effects of inflation, the real rate of interest. Let me give you just a quick example. Let's suppose you have $100 today and you invest it uh, in the bank at 10%. So a year from now, how much are you going to have? You're going to have $110, right? 10% of 100 is $10. Add that to the original investment, you get $110. But let's suppose that today, when you had that $100, you had the choice between making the investment or going out and buying a brand new financial calculator. And you say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to make the investment because I think I'm going to get more interest so that I can buy a financial calculator a year from now, plus have some money left over. Well, if the price of a financial calculator increases by 10%. A year from now, that financial calculator costs $110. Well, you're no better off, right? You could have bought the calculator today for 100, or you could have bought the calculator a year from now for $110. Well, that doesn't sound like you're winning anything or you're gaining anything. In fact, isn't there a tremendous opportunity cost in there? What was your real rate of return? Your real rate of return was 0%. 
So then we add a couple of premiums in there. We have to add an inflation premium, which during my time in the CFA program, which was about 20 years ago, inflation was, was very small. So we may have added one or 2%. But nowadays, now that we're into the 2020s, you guys know this inflation in the United States is oh, 7%, 9%, 6%, whatever it is. So that's a huge premium that we add to the interest rate. Then we add a default risk premium. And that default risk is a function of the default risk or the probability of default of the borrower. So if you go to the mortgage banker and say, I want to borrow money to refinance my loan, and the banker says, what did I say, 7 or 8%, well, the banker is going to make an assessment of your probability of defaulting. And let's suppose that you're like I am. You know, you have a good job. Uh, you have low credit card. You have no car payment. Your mortgage payments are relatively low, et cetera, et cetera. You have a good retirement. You have some assets. Well, the banker is going to charge you probably a low default risk premium. On the other hand, suppose one of my sons goes to the banker and does the same thing. And the banker says to my sons, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't have a job. You don't have a college education. You don't have any income. You don't have any assets. Well, hey, the banker might say no. But then the banker might say, hey, we're going to charge you a, a relatively large default risk premium, depending on the ability of that borrow to, borrower to repay. Now, of course, I was making that up about my sons. They, they do okay. Then we're going to add a liquidity premium. And this is a super important concept. This is a great exam question. Let's suppose that I come to you and I say, hey, I want to borrow $100. I'll pay you back next week. And you say, all right, Jim, I'll charge you 10%. Let's, let's do 10%. But then I come right back to you and say, hey, I want to borrow $100. I'm going to pay you back next year. Well, here's this concept of you giving up access to that capital for a longer time period. Here's this opportunity cost, the specter of the opportunity that you might lose because you signed a contract for me for that one year period rather than a one day or a one week period. So you're going to add a liquidity premium that is probably going to increase with the time to maturity on the loan. And then finally, you're going to add a maturity premium. And now this is very different from the liquidity premium, although it sounds like it's related to maturity. And in fact, it is. So let's go back to my example. Suppose that you lend me $100 for a one day loan at 10%. And then you lend me $100 for a one year loan at some other number, let's say 11%. And then during the course of this day, you decide that you want your money back. What you can do is you can sell this loan in the secondary market to somebody else. Now, if you sell this one day loan to somebody else so that you can get your capital today, you might get $99 or $99.50. But if you sell the one year loan to someone in the secondary market, maybe you're only going to get $92 or $91. That's the maturity premium. The fact that if you sell the loan, the longer term loan, that's why it's called a maturity premium, you're going to get uh, you're going to get less. There we go. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about this concept of nominal risk free rate of interest versus the real risk free rate of interest. So what do we say back here? This model was simplified by a dude named Fisher all the way back in the 1920s or 1930s. And what he started with was just the first plus sign. He didn't add those three extra plus signs. He was looking at the relationship between the nominal interest rate and the real interest rate and the inflation premium. And he came up with this bolded formula here in the middle of the page. Notice that we add one to each of those rates to reflect the idea of the ability to earn interest over time. This is called compounding. Now look at the first, uh, the first box. It is generally approximated by ignoring the one plus and just summing the real risk free rate and the inflation premium. Now, if the real risk rate 
real risk-free rate is 1.2% and the inflation premium is 1.7%, then you can get away with using that approximation formula. But boy, oh boy, on the exam, I would make sure I add one to it because the Institute, they could easily say the real rate is 7.2% and inflation is 11.6%. And then the farther you get away from zero, the less accurate that simple addition equation at the bottom becomes. So I would just forget about that one and use and use the bolded one in the middle with the one plus because it accurately reflects the idea of compounding. All right, so let's look at this next LOS about uh, how are we going to measure a return over a time period? Let's go back to my example. You have $100 today. If you have $110 at the end of the period, well, that's a 10% holding period return. Now, this is really important. That holding period could be one day, it could be a month, it could be a year, it could be 10 years, it could be a, a hundred years. I mean, think about this. Suppose, suppose that on the day I was born, that my father took $100 and invested it. And I'm in my 60s now, so on my 61st birthday, that $100 is worth $110. What's my holding period return? Well, if my holding period return is 61 years, then it's, it's 10%. So what we need to do is make sure that we identify the holding period. So what the Institute is very likely to do on the exam is say, compute the holding period return. And here's the holding period. Maybe it will be a day, maybe it'll be a week, maybe it'll be a year. We'll have to make some adjustments. We'll do that in, in a slide or two. But this is a super simple equation here. So look down at the bottom there. We have the ending value. There was my 110 minus the beginning value. There was my 100. Now in my example, there were no in, there was no income generated during that period. So our asset income was zero, zero. So 110 minus 100 divided by 100, that gives us a holding period return of 10%. Now suppose that this security was a share of stock and there was a $5 dividend paid during the course of that holding period. Well, we would have 110 minus 100, that gives me 10, right? Plus the five, plus the five, that gives me 15 divided by 100. So now I'm at a 15% holding period return. So be aware, sometimes that asset income over on the far right uh, part of the numerator, sometimes that's zero, but sometimes it's not. So let me give you a warning for the exam, and we'll do this throughout level one, that asset income could be a dividend paid if it's a share of stock, and it could be an interest payment if it's, a, if it's a bond. What happens if the holding period is longer than one year? Consider an example here in which we have a five-year period. So imagine the Institute uh, providing on an exam question returns over a five-year period. Maybe they were 10% and 12% and 8% and 13% and maybe even a minus 2%. So all we would do to find that five-year holding period return, we would simply just add one to each one of those returns and then subtract one at the end to get rid of the, uh, to get rid of the compounding number one, uh, one factor. What that would do is if we had $100 today and after five years, we had, what were those numbers, 10%, 12%, 8%, 6%, minus 2%, we would do all that. We would subtract out one. That would tell us exactly what our five-year holding period return was. And then we just multiply that by the 100 and we would get that final future value. Maybe it's 120, maybe it's 150, maybe it's 80. Oh, by the way, if each one of those annual returns was negative, we would turn that 100 into, say, $85 or something like that. Let's do a quick example of what I think is a super likely exam question. All right, so we paid $20 per share. Current share price has grown by 50%. We've received a whole bunch of dividend payments at 50 cents a share. What will be the holding period return if we decide to sell those today? All right, so there's our beginning value. We take the 20 times the 500. So we started out with 10,000 over in the far right column. What's the ending value? Well, we have the 20 times the 500, but then, here, let me go back quickly. 
Look at that second bullet point. The current share price has grown by 50%. So what do we do? We add one to 50%. So 1.5, that gets us up to 15,000. And then what did we get? We got uh, 50 cents of a dividend payment 10 times. So 10 times 50 cents times the 500 in there, that gives us $2,500. So how do we compute that holding period return? Uh, we ended up with 15. We started out with 10, so we take 15 minus the 10. We add the 2,500 in there of the asset income. In this case, it was dividends. Remember I said it could be interest as well, divided by the original amount. There we go, 75% is that uh, holding period return. What was our holding period? Five years. Now the next section of this learning module uh, moves into a slightly different direction. Uh, the question says something like, hey, suppose that we have a series of holding period returns and it's super easy just to assume that the holding periods are one year. So the question then becomes, suppose that we have, what were those numbers I gave you? 10% and 12% and 8% and 6%, whatever those numbers are. What is the average of those holding period returns over that time period? Now, I'm going to guess that you learned this, and I tease my students all the time. I say, didn't you learn this back in kindergarten, taking the average, you know? Uh, Jenny has six apples, Johnny has four apples. What's the average number of apples? And they look at me and say, we didn't go to any kind of kindergarten like that, Jim. But that's clearly what we do. We learned this early on in our mathematical life. So all we're gonna do is put a bunch of plus signs uh, in between all of our apples, but instead of apples, these are going to be the holding period returns, and then we're gonna divide by uh, those number of observations. So here's a super simple example, 25 and 10, 12, and then a minus three. Don't forget to put the plus minus in your calculator uh, over the last four years. So if you sum those four annual holding period returns and then divide by four, you get 11%. Now there's a great example that shows up in many, many textbooks. Are you ready for this? Suppose that I am your portfolio manager and you send me $100,000 today. And during the first year, I invest that $100,000 and at the end of the year, it's worth $200,000. Well, that's a 100% return. Now, during the second year, I invest that $200,000 and by the end of that year, I have $100,000. So I turned 100 into 200, that was 100% return, and then I turned 200 into 100, that's a minus 50% return. What's the average return? Well, you take 100 and you subtract out the 50 uh, and you divide by two, that's a 25% return. So the arithmetic return, the average return is a super really good starting point, but it can be misleading because it doesn't reflect compounding. So this is what I'm gonna to say to you as your portfolio manager, I'm gonna say, wait a minute, I averaged 25% return over the two years that you allowed me to manage your capital. I deserve a bonus, I deserve Super Bowl tickets, I deserve all sorts of great stuff. And you're gonna look at me and you're gonna say, Jim, have you lost your mind? You turned 100,000 of my money into 100,000 of my money. That is terrible investing, you're fired. So we need better rates of return. So here we go. The geometric return, what this does is it includes the impact and the effects of compounding. So there's the equation there. All we're going to do is we're going to say one plus. So we're used to the one plus. We're going to take one plus the first year, one plus the second year, one plus the third year. We're going to multiply all those. We're going to subtract one. Now notice there, we're going to take the square root if it's two years. We'll take the cube root and the fourth root and the fifth root and the 100th root. What we're going to do is we're going to, and this is the way I teach my students, this geometric mean return is kind of like the effects of decompounding over those time periods.
So it's a really super easy calculation here. Let's go back to our example. So we have 1.25 times 1.1 times 1.12 times 0.97, right? We subtract three from one. So you put those in your calculator. So think about it. What does that mean? We've increased by 25%. We increased by 10. We increased by 12. So we're earning interest on top of interest. Then we lose 3%. So if you put those inside of the parentheses, you come up with, well, let me just go back here and remind you what you come up with. You come up with this thing that we did here. Now, this box answered the question, what is the five-year holding period return. Ah, now this thing here, where am I? I don't want to go too far. This thing, because we're going to raise it to the one over the T, this is going to take that extended holding period return and squish. By the way, squish is not a finance term. We're going to squish it down to an average annual return. This is the geometric mean, and we're going to subtract one. And that gives us uh, that gives us 10.6%. So go back here. What was our answer? Our arithmetic mean was 11%. Our compounding mean, our geometric mean was less. Of course, it's less because it reflects the idea of earning interest during all of those time periods. Now, going back to my example, how do we compute the geometric mean for my earlier example? So what did I do? 100%. So what's 1 plus 1? That's 2. And then what did I do? I lost 50%. So that's 1 minus 50%. So that's 0.5. What's half of 2 is 1. When you raise 1 to the 1 half, what do you get? You get 1. Subtract 1, you get a 0% return. So this is a great piece of knowledge for you to take through the level one and level two and level three, but for this level one exam that, uh, that I can claim, here, let me go back here. I can claim my arithmetic, I'll just go right there. My arithmetic return was 25%. My geometric return was 0%. Ah, that makes perfect sense. Hopefully my example was worthwhile. Of course, there are other types of means out there, one of which is the harmonic mean. And all we're going to do, look at that red box. All we're going to do is divide. Now, what do we do back here? For this arithmetic mean, we divided by the number of observations, right? We divided by T. What we're going to do here is we're going to divide by the reciprocal of each of those observations. So look in the denominator of the X bar sub H, which is the harmonic mean. We're going to sum all of the reciprocals. So this is really just another way of computing the average. Um, there are essentially two applications of the harmonic mean. We mentioned one there in parentheses. Uh, using price earnings ratios, and we'll talk about this throughout the CFA program, how important price earnings ratios are to our understanding of valuation and all sorts of other really cool things when we look at uh, we look at stock prices and company valuations. But it's also useful from an investment standpoint when you invest different amounts of money in a particular fund or asset over time period. So those are the two uses of the harmonic mean, and that's probably a good uh, a good exam question as well. So keep that equation in mind there. Boy, it looks kind of cumbersome, but let's go ahead and look at an example. Here's an example where we're going to allocate different amounts of capital over a time period, prices of 10, 12, and 15. So what is the average price paid per share over that three months? Now, what we could do is we could just take 10, plus 12, plus 15, and, and divide by three, that would be some number. That would be the arithmetic mean. But the harmonic mean is going to be reflective of the two and the three and the 4,000. So all we're going to do is take the three months, right? So we have three months of return. That's the numerator. And divide by 1 tenth, 1 twelfth, and 1 fifteenth. So there's our harmonic mean, and that is 12. Remember, harmonic mean is useful for ratios, like the PE ratios, and uh, allocation of different capital over time period. 
Now, what we'll learn as we move through this these learning modules in quantitative methods is that we can have small data sets and we can have large data sets. And among all of the problems with data sets is this concept of an outlier. What do we do if, uh, if we have an outlier, right? Suppose that we have, suppose we have 10 firms and what we're trying to do is compare valuation based on dividend yields and nine of those firms have dividend yields of somewhere around 2%, you know, 1.92, 2.01, but then there's one that has 6.05. What the heck do you do with an outlier? Because if you throw a 6.02 into that data set that was coagulated around the 2%, it's going to skew the data set. So how do we handle these outliers? Um, so we can do a trimmed mean. Let's just take a look at a quick example. Data set, 10 observations, 12, 15, 18, 20, 22, 25, 29, 30, 35, and 40. Well, what are we going to do? We're just going to take the lowest and we're going to take the highest. Now, in this example, they may or may not be outliers, but they're at the extreme end. So instead of taking the arithmetic mean of 10 observations, we're going to take the arithmetic mean of most of the observations, right? So that'll be just eight. So we get rid of the 12, we get rid of the 40, and we have a trimmed mean of 24. We can also compute a Windsorized mean, which essentially does the same thing that the trimmed mean does, but at a different level. Um, notice back here, we cut our data set from 10 down to eight. But with the Windsorized mean, what we're gonna do is we're going to keep the data set at 12, but we're going to replace those extreme observations with some other number. And we have a couple of choices of what that some other number is. The simple Windsorized mean is just to replace, you know, read through the read through the orange teardrop with me. We're going to replace the 8 with a 12. So you'd have two 12s. We're going to replace the 50 with a 40. So we'd have two 40s. So that's the simplest way of doing the Windsorized mean. But you can also do it in the way that we have here in this particular example. You can assign a stated percentage of lowest values and highest values. What we're going to do in this case is the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile. So, boy, we'll learn how to compute percentiles in a future learning module. But let me just give it to you simple stuff here. Uh, since we have 12 observations, it's not an obvious notion what the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile is. But for ease of calculation, notice what we did. We took the average of 8 and 12. That's 10. So we replaced the 8 with a 10. And then at the very end, we took the average of the 37, I'm sorry, the 35 and the 40. That's around the 90th percentile. And we replaced the 50 with that 37 and a half. So with the Windsorized mean, keep in mind that we're going to keep the same data set, but we're going to replace the extreme examples, which are outliers, right, uh, with some other number. And that some other number is going to be one, one of these two choices here, right? So go ahead and compute the Windsorized mean. There you go, boy. If the Institute asked you to take the average of 12 numbers on an exam, well, you get your calculator out and you're punching away, uh, you're punching away. Well, that's why the Institute wants you to use, and this is my favorite calculator, because you can tell how many you entered with that Sigma button. And then with the uh, Texas Instruments, you could, you could do the same thing. There's an N in there. Let's move on to the concepts of money-weighted and time-weighted rates of return. These are important measurements that are going to be part of levels two and level three. I'm always interested, uh, the way the Institute presents this, uh, 
it calls them money weighted and time weighted an internal rate of return but it doesn't emphasize nearly as much that these are geometric returns money weighted time weighted internal rate of return they're all geometric returns so think geometric is kind of like the big umbrella and then you can have these different kinds of geometric returns now, in order to solve for money-weighted and time-weighted, we're going to use the IRR button on our calculator. Look at that little green box in there. What we're doing is we're going to sum the cash flows in the numerator, and then we're going to add one to the internal rate of return. And so I will show you how to do that here in just a minute. Essentially, what we're doing is we're solving for the rate of return that forces the present value of all of those cash flows to be some number. I'll show you that here in just a second. So here's an example. We start with $200 in a mutual fund. We add $250 at the beginning of the second year, $150 at the beginning of the third year, and at the end of the third year, uh, we're going to withdraw $400. We earn 10, 6.6, .6, and 6 in year three. How are we going to compute the money weighted return? All right, so before I go to that next slide, I want you to think about this. What are we doing? We, we added 200. We started with 200. Then we add 250. Then, then we add 150. And then we take out 400. And so what is the rate of return based on 10, 6.6, .6, and 6%? So you should kind of think to yourself, well, this is going to be some kind of an average of those three returns. And that's true. But the average depends on the timing of those cash flows. All right, so watch what we're going to do here. Look at that uh, table on the left. So there's our, we start with 200, right? The investment return is 10%. So at the end, we have 220. So we start with 220. We add the 250, our investment return of, what was that second year return? Was that 6.6? .6? So that's 6.6. .6, that gets us up to uh, 501. Then we just do the same process there again in year three. So our ending balance is $290 at the end, at the end of that following year. So there's a good timeline. Let's start at the very bottom. We start out with 200. You don't really need to divide by one there. And then what do we do? We, we add the 250. So that's a minus because we're making that investment. Then we add the 150. That's a minus because we're making the investment. And then, and then we have a plus 400 because we're withdrawing, right? That's a cash inflow. And then we're left with 290 at the end of year four. So I want you to imagine trying to figure out what is the IRR that equates this left-hand side of the equal sign and the right-hand side of this equal sign, which, which has to be zero. Well, you could guess. You could say, hey, uh, maybe it's 7%. So go ahead and put 7% in there and then compute it. If it comes out to be zero, then you know it's right. But given the answer there at the bottom, you know that that's not 7%. So how do we do this? Well, we get out our financial calculator. There are the steps. So we say cash flow zero is a minus 200. Cash flow one is a minus 250. Cash flow two is a minus 150. Cash flow three is a plus 400. Cash flow four is a plus 290. And then all you have to do is hit your IRR button and you'll get 5.72%. So I encourage you to go ahead and pause the recording right now and make certain that you can get 5.72% in your financial calculator. Of course, the money weighted return is appropriate when you have a client who has lots of cash, cash inflows and lots of cash outflows at different times during the course of a holding period. In this case, in this case it was three years. But how do we evaluate uh, a portfolio manager, maybe a mutual fund manager who has multiple clients out there and each client has different cash inflows and cash outflows. How do we evaluate that portfolio manager? And of course, the answer is through a time weighted rate of return. What we're going to do is we're just going to say, you know what, we're going to take out all of those cash flows that were dictated by the client's uh, direction and we're going to go ahead and compute another internal rate of return. We're going to call it a, uh, a time weighted return. Look at the second box. It is not sensitive to additions and withdrawals of the fund. 
This is a very similar calculation to what we just did. It, it's super simple. All we're going to do is we're going to take the one plus those rates of return for each year, right? One plus R1 times one plus R2 and R3 and R10 and R50 and whatever that is. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, and subtract one just like we did, and then we can convert that to an annual one that we do uh, that we do down in the bottoms. So let's go ahead and look at an example. All right, four shares of UUA stock at forty-four dollars during the year. The company pays a three-dollar special dividend. Now remember, every shareholder gets that three dollars in special dividends, and that applies to all shareholders. End of the first year, the investor buys five more shares at $46. Uh, lastly, at the end, he sold all shares for $57. No dividends during the second. Uh, all right, so the time weighted return. Well, let's go ahead and figure out this holding period return for the first year. So we have 46 minus the 44. We have to add the $3. So there's 11.36%. Holding period for the second year, boy, we went all the way up to 57 minus the 46. So there's the 23.91. So what is that time weighted return? It is one plus the 11.36 times one plus the 23.91. Since it's two years, we're going to raise that to the one half, subtract one, and that gives me 17.4%. That is the time weighted return. Notice, notice in that third line, at the end of the first year, the investor buys five more shares at 46. Well, in the time weighted return, we don't care about that five more shares. We don't even care about the four shares that the investor originally bought. When you do time-weighted returns, you just assume that the investor has one share of stock. Now, if this question asks us to compute the money-weighted return, then we would have to consider the five shares and the four shares, and we get a number that was probably pretty close to 7.4, but it won't be exactly 7.4. All right, here's a summary here. Money weighted return, internal rate of return on a portfolio, I've already said that. Considers withdrawals and contributions, right? It's a good measure to evaluate the performance of the investor who directs the withdrawals and the contributions. Time weighted rate of return is the geometric mean. Of course, it's the geometric routine, uh, mean. It's also an internal rate of return. Uh, not sensitive to withdrawals is a good measure of the performance of a fund manager. All right, so those, this slide is super critical for exam questions. You know, one of the things that you'll learn from me as you go through all of my recordings is that every LOS is great resource for a question that shows up on the exam, but some have higher likelihoods than others. So I try to identify those that have a higher likelihood. So I can't sit here and say, I guarantee you that uh, the difference between money-weighted and time-weighted rate of return is going to be on your exam. But I could say that it has a super high probability of showing up on the exam. I probably could make the following conclusion, although I might be taking a huge risk by saying this. Out of the next five level one exams, I... Boy, do I want to say it? Do I want to say I guarantee this question will show up? But I don't know, 99%, whatever that is. All right, how about if our holding period return is some other time period than, that is less than a year? How do we turn a less than one year holding period return into an annual return? And so here we're going to do this. Uh, it's called an annualized return. So notice we have some new terminology here. This is going to be super familiar when we do the next learning module of time value of money. There, PV is present value. FV is future value. There's an R, which is some interest rate. And then M is the number of compounding periods in a year. Now, remember that uh, you can compound interest over any time period. Of course, it's just natural to say, let's assume annual compounding. But what if interest is compounded semi-annually? 
or quarterly or monthly or daily or hourly well then you have to make some uh, some adjustments and so these next couple of slides are those uh, are those slight adjustments but it shouldn't be a surprise to what we're going to do here so look at that annual return is one plus the periodic return raised to the number of periods during the year and the the learning module uses the notation c so if I earn 6% during the first six months of the year, to annualize that, I'm going to say 1.06, and I'm just going to square it, right? There are two six-month periods during the course of the year. And then as we've been doing for multiple, multiple times for that geometric return thing, we just subtract one. Let's go ahead and take a look at a quick example or two. Look up at the top in the green bullet point. Let's suppose we have a monthly return of 0.7%. Well, the question then becomes, if we generated 0.7% during January and we repeat that 0.7% in the rest of the 11 months, what will the annualized return be? Well, this is simple math. All we're going to do is take 1 plus the 0.7%. No mistaking there's the 007. There's my first level one reference of James Bond the first of many, many that will come in the future. We're going to raise it to the 12th power, subtract one, we get 8.73%. So if this were semi-annual, you'd raise it to the two. If it were quarterly, you'd raise it to the four. If it were daily, you'd raise it to the 365. If it were hourly, uh, you're on your own. All right, how about the second quick example? Suppose that instead of one month, we have a 15 month return of 16%. How can you annualize this? This is kind of what I was referring to just a few moments ago about kind of decompounding. So we're gonna do the same thing that we did above. We're gonna take one plus, in this case, the 16%, but we're going to raise it by something less than one. We're gonna raise it to the uh, four over five, which is 15 months over 12 months, subtract one, and that uh, that gives us 12.61%. How about another example here? We have two bonds, A and B, time since issuance, 120 days. Uh, time since issuance, since issuance, eight months. Return is two and a half percent on bond A, and 6% on bond B, which bond has the highest annualized rate of return? So let's go ahead and do quick math. So we'll take the one plus the 2.5% for bond A, and we'll go ahead and raise it to the 365 divided by 120, right? We're gonna replicate that 120 day period, subtract out the one, we get 8.18%. We'll do the same thing for bond B, 365 divided by 240. Eight months is 240 days. Did you guys know that before getting out your calculator? So bond, uh, bond B has the highest, has the higher annualized rate of return. Now, what was I saying earlier that you could compound annually or quarterly or monthly or daily or hourly or minutely, is that a word? How about secondly? Well, what's the fastest, what is the most frequent time period of compounding? And of course, it's continuous compounding. This, for those of you who are history buffs, uh, became super popular around 1980 when there was lots and lots of deregulation. And so uh, some financial institutions, because of their charter, were able to pay and offer continuous compounding. So they raised, raised lots and lots of money. There was a scandal in the 1980s. Oh boy, I wonder if you guys were even alive during that scandal. Uh, go ahead and spend a moment looking up that scandal. Cost the federal government, I don't know, several hundred billion dollars uh, for a bailout. But the question then becomes, how do you handle something that is continuously compounded? Oh boy. So think about it. What did we do in our financial calculators? We took an interest rate like 10% and we added one to it to get 1.10. We multiplied that by, well, let me go back to my original example. Let's say $100 to get 110, right? We start with 100, we ended up with 110. That's annual compounding. 
Well, if continuously compounding is the most frequent form of compounding, well then that future value has to be the highest. It has to be the maximum future value possible. And the way we're going to do this is we're not going to search for an infinity function on our calculator. Now there was a dude named Euler who did this for us and it's summarized with the e to the x button on our calculator. Go ahead and find that now. And it's also summarized by the ln button on the calculator. And so this is super, super simple. Uh, what I want you to do is the following here. Let me get out my calculator. Ready? And I got to take my glasses off because I can't see. All right. So what I want you to do is I want you to put uh, 0 0.10 in your calculator. And then I want you to hit the blue e to the x button. What do you get? You get 1.1052. And by the way, I always tell my students that they should set their calculator to four decimal places. That way you don't, uh, you don't lose out on any rounding. Although I can't imagine anybody failing the CFA exam because of rounding errors, but, but four decimal places. So you get 1.105. What was it for annual compounding? 1.10, but now we're adding the 0.52 onto the end because we're earning interest on top of interest on top of interest. And then what I want you to do is I want you to find your LN button. In this 12C, it's another blue button. Hit the blue LN button and you're back to 10%. So we're going to use those two buttons. There they are in that very first uh, uh, blue box. We're going to take the natural log of the future price. Well, there you go. That's that's let's say 110 in my example divided by the 100. And that's going to give you the continuously compounded rate of return. So you can go from the LN to the EX to the E to the LN to the EX. They're kind of like reciprocals of each other. Don't tell your math teacher that uh, that I said that. Now, what we can do is we can write this continuously compounded rate of return in, in a different form. And all we're going to do is sum those continuously compounded rates of return right there at the bottom of that uh, blue box. Let's go ahead and remind ourselves about one of those first equations in one of the first slides in this slide deck. There's that relationship between some kind of a nominal rate of return and the real rate of return. What we can do is adjust that and make some substitutions that are a function of that building block model from the very beginning of this slide deck. So look at the green teardrop point and the one plus the real return is equal to one plus the real risk free rate times one plus the risk premium divided by one plus the rate of inflation. This is super important when we're trying to measure some type of a return across different time periods and between and among different countries because let's suppose we're in the United States and we have inflation of 6% and we're investing in Canada and Canada has inflation of 11%. Well, what we need to do is figure out what is that inflation premium and it's going to be the relative rate of inflation between those, uh, between those two countries. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, a likely example exam question here. Let's compute the real rate of return. All right, so we've collected historical geometric returns. All right, so that's important. Stocks return a 9%. Now remember, stocks have a couple of different components in there. We're going to learn at length about those components as we move forward. Municipal bonds, 5%, uh, cash equivalents are 1.5%. Rate of inflation has been 2.3%. What is the real rate of return for stocks? So we're going to ignore the municipal bond yield. We're going to ignore the cash yield, right? We're going to focus on that 9%. So we're going to use that equation there and we're going to just simply say 1 plus that 9% divided by 1 plus the 2.3% minus 1 gives us a real return on stocks of 6 and 2 thirds percent. Now this is super important because that equity return of 9%, as I said just a moment ago, has a couple of different components to it. Of course, it has a risk-free component to it. It has a risk premium component to it. But since we're given that yield on equities of 9%, we can just assume that that number has been calculated by some of those other numbers before it. 
Now let's go ahead and figure out some kind of a return based on taxes and based on fees. So let's start with gross and net returns. Of course, a gross return is the return that is earned prior to any kind of a fee. Let's go back to my original example. What did I say? You, you provided me with $100,000 and I turned it into $200,000, right? That was a 100% gross return. But if I charged you $40,000 for my services, then you had 200 at the end, take out the 40, that means you only had 60. So instead of a 100% return, that would be a 60% net return. So the net return is post deduction of fees. And there's a simple example using 5%, right? So one minus that 5%. You ought to get in the habit of, look in parentheses, we have one, which is really 100%, minus something. And that one minus something could be a percent of management fee. It could be some other percent of some other kind of fee. But a lot of times it's going to be a, a tax rate, which we're going to do down, the, down at the bottom. So get in the habit of multiplying some kind of a total return times one minus something. And that one minus something is going to be either a fee or a tax. So pre-tax and after-tax returns, uh, just look at the teardrop example down at the bottom. If we have 15% pre-tax return, 25% tax rate, well, then we only get after-tax 11.25%, right? So that makes sense. We earn 15, but we have to pay the government some amount, 25%, which leaves us with 75% of that 15%. Oh, leverage returns. These are super important, especially when we do some fairly complex math in level two. Uh, a leveraged return simply means that the investor uses borrowed capital to add to the investment. I mean, just think about it this way. Suppose you came to me and you said, hey, Jim, here's $100,000. This is my money. But I also went to the bank and I borrowed $50,000. So instead of giving me just $100,000 of your own equity, right, you give me $100,000 plus a $50,000 loan, I get to invest $50,000 extra dollars. Wow, this is the beauty of leverage. If I take that and I double it to $300,000, well, then your return is going to be greater, assuming that you uh, can pay off the interest uh, on that loan. So look down uh, in the top of that green box there, the leveraged return, right, R sub L, is the portfolio return divided by portfolio equity, which in my example would be the 100,000, not, not the 150,000 total investment, just, just the, uh, just the 100,000. So all we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, compute the portfolio return. So we'll do the V sub E and the V sub B inside of the parentheses. So that's the value of the debt and the equity. You know, you buy some bonds and you buy some shares of stock times the investment return. There's the RP. And then we're going to subtract out the amount of the loan times the interest rate on the loan. And so there's a, a formula there on the right hand side that you should probably memorize. Let's do one quick final example in which we have seven and a half million of equity, but 35% is financed by some form of debt and we're paying 5% interest on that loan. Now the equity portfolio generates a 9% total annual investment return. The question then becomes, what is the leveraged return? So I want you to think about this uh, on two levels, right? We, we generate 9% on 7.5 million, we have to pay a 5% interest rate on 35% of that 7.5 million. So that 5% is going to eat into that 9%. However, the existence of a loan is going to allow us to magnify the returns on our total portfolio. So we have this thing that I call the beauty of leverage. So we get 9%. We're paying 5% on it, but we're hoping that that leverage, meaning we're only paying a fixed 5% on that loan, that leverage is going to enable us to generate a higher return. All right, so let's go ahead and do the quick math. So the return on the portfolio is 9%, and then we're gonna do the ratio of the 35% of the bond, which is 2.625, so that's the amount of the loan. 
the amount of equity that we had to supply was only 4.875 million, not the entire 7.5 million. Now notice the ratio, 2.6 and 4.8, they must sum, of course, to the seven and a half million dollars. The fact that we're dividing by just 4.875 million and not the 7.5 million, this is called the magnification of returns due to leverage. Then what we're doing is we're gonna multiply that by the difference between nine and 5%. That's the part that is eating into our returns. But because we generated a return greater than 9%, well, notice the math, we get up to 11.15%. So this is called the beauty of leverage in which we use 35% of somebody else's money. We earn 9% on it, and all we have to do is pay 5% on that, uh, on that loan. Now, couple that 35% debt with our own equity of nearly $5 million, that translates into an 11.15% return. And that takes us through our learning outcome statements. So what I want you to do now is I want you to go to the end of this learning module. There are a handful of questions that we have covered. You ought to be able to work through those mathematically. I'll give you a final piece of advice and I'll say this again after the next learning module. If you cannot figure out and master rates of return and time value of money, you have no chance uh, no chance of passing on the exam. So this is that very first building block. This is super important. So I want you to spend considerable amount of time to master this topic and the next topic so that when we go to level two and level three and I say something like, oh, continuously compounded, you're gonna say to yourself, oh yeah, I knew that back in level one and I'm going to have retained it. So this is a super important concept to know that the Institute loves it. They demand that what we learn in level one, we carry to level two, we carry to level three, because those level three questions can be almost anything uh, throughout the CFA program, and they're gonna use money-weighted returns and time-weighted returns and continuous compounding. So thanks for watching, uh, have a great day, and good luck studying.